All right, let me call the uh, February 2013 meeting of the Federal Communications Commission to order. Uh, before we start, I want to uh, welcome some, uh, some very important guests today. We have a group here of congressional staff participating in our uh, Education Week for Hill staff. We do this every year. Uh, I think we do it more than once a year. Uh, and it's been a, a terrific program that's brought together the staff, uh, generally of the congressional committees um, uh, responsible for uh, FCC in these issue areas, together with our staff. Uh, uh, and uh, there are so many, um, rep there are representatives from so many different members here. I'm not going to single out any specific member, but we really do appreciate the, uh, you coming. Um, I, uh, some of you know this, but my first job out of college was as a uh, congressional staffer. Uh, which uh, which broke uh, my mother's dream that I would become a doctor. Uh, now, I, uh, I, the good news, at least for my mom, to a certain extent, was that I, I did spend time uh, working as an emergency medical technician, which turned out to be a great training for the job I eventually got with Chuck Schumer. <laughs> And uh, so uh, I, I know all of your jobs can be incredibly exciting, challenging. The issues are great. We're very pleased you're here. Uh, I know in addition to being here for the meeting today, uh, you're going to have a session with our chief technologist, Julie Knapp. His Spectrum 101 class uh, really is uh, terrific. You'll enjoy that. Uh, I know you're doing an Auctions 101 class tomorrow morning. Uh, so thank you all for coming. And uh, we very much value our relationship uh, with Congress and with congressional staff. Uh, and this is a great program that we will continue. With that, Madam Secretary, would you please introduce our agenda for this morning? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. Today's agenda includes two items for your consideration. First, you will consider a report in order to significantly enhance wireless coverage for consumers while protecting wireless networks from interference by adopting new technical and operational requirements for signal boosters. Second, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking to substantially increase the amount of unlicensed spectrum available to accelerate the growth and expansion of new Wi-Fi technology, offering consumers faster speeds and less network congestion at Wi-Fi hotspots. This is your agenda for today. The first item will be presented by the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Ruth Milkman, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. and. Uh Ruth, whenever you're ready. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. It's my great pleasure to introduce this draft report and order to improve the quality, availability, and effectiveness of signal boosters for consumers and small businesses. This report and order represents a significant step forward in the Commission's efforts to promote deployment of mobile voice and broadband services, especially in areas with little or no wireless coverage. It also furthers the important goal of improving public safety communications while protecting wireless networks from interference by ensuring that available signal boosters meet detailed, consensus-based technical specifications. The draft notice before you involved significant input from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, as well as from the Office of Engineering and Technology. And the wireless, on behalf of the Wireless Bureau, we thank them for their important contributions to this item. Joining me at the table are John Leibovitz, Deputy Chief of the Wireless Bureau, Roger Noel, Chief of the Mobility Division, Tom Derringe, Deputy Chief of Mobility, and Joyce Jones, who is an attorney in the Mobility Division of the Wireless Bureau. Joyce will present the item. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. This draft report and order furthers the Commission's ongoing efforts to promote deployment of mobile voice and broadband services in the United States. The new rules will enhance wireless coverage for consumers, particularly in rural, underserved, and difficult to serve areas, by broadening the availability of signal boosters. Signal boosters amplify signals between wireless devices and wireless networks, which can bridge gaps within service areas and extend coverage at the fringe of those areas. Malfunctioning, poorly designed, or improperly installed signal boosters, however, can cause interference to wireless networks. The draft report and order therefore includes stringent industry consensus-based technical rules for consumer signal boosters, which incorporate sufficient safeguards to mitigate interference to wireless networks. The draft report and order creates two classes of signal boosters, consumer and industrial, 
with distinct regulatory requirements for each. Consumer signal boosters are designed to be used out of the box by individuals to improve their wireless coverage in their homes and vehicles. These devices must incorporate specific technical safeguards, what we call the network protection standard, designed to protect wireless networks from harmful interference. The network protection standard is the product of close collaboration between wireless providers and, and device manufacturers and represents a substantial improvement in signal booster design. Consumers may use signal boosters under their wireless provider's license subject to certain requirements, including licensee consent and registration. All four nationwide wireless providers, Verizon Wireless, T-Mobile, Sprint, and AT&T, as well as 90 rural providers, have already stated that they will allow their subscribers to use signal boosters that meet the network protection standard. The new rules also require consumer signal boosters to be labeled in order to inform consumers about which devices are appropriate for their use and how to comply with our rules. In addition, any signal booster which causes interference must be shut down, even if it complies with the network protection standard. Industrial signal boosters include a wide variety of devices that are designed for installation by licensees or professional installers. These devices are typically designed to serve multiple users and cover larger areas such as stadiums, airports, hospitals, tunnels, and educational campuses. Industrial signal boosters require an FCC license or express licensee consent to operate and must be appropriately labeled to prevent misuse by consumers. This draft report and order also revises technical and operational requirements for duly licensed Part 90 private land mobile non-consumer signal boosters. The report and order creates a new framework for the manufacture, operation, and regulation of signal boosters with clear rules of the road for all stakeholders. The new rules should promote further investment in and usage of this promising technology. The staff recommends that the commission adopt this report and order and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and excellent work. Let's proceed to uh, comments from the bench. Commissioner McDowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I too would like to welcome our overseers from Congress uh, representing the directly elected representatives of the American people. Uh, so uh, welcome, and I, I have always subscribed to the notion that, uh, or the principle that we don't tell Congress what's, what to do, Congress tells us what to do. So if you see something today you don't like, please uh, speak up now. Uh, this is a good opportunity. Um, but in the meantime, this is an example of a deliberative body in Washington that actually can act with unanimity, so uh, at least most of the time. So take that back up the hill a little bit. Um, the uh, consumer benefits of signal boosters are unquestioned. Uh, they are important components in the comprehensive private sector effort to maximize spectral efficiency. Boosters allow Americans in rural areas and those that live on the fringe of a provider service area to receive stronger signal strength and improved wireless broadband coverage. They are also used to improve public safety communications and wireless services in buildings, tunnels, and other areas where service can be sometimes unreliable. These benefits and improvements can be accomplished rapidly and affordably without commercial mobile radio service, uh, CMRS providers, also known as just wireless companies, uh, uh, building additional infrastructure. Although it is estimated that over 2 million consumer signal boosters are currently deployed, there were no rules regarding their operation until today. While the majority of boosters have been improving the consumer experience without incident, wireless service providers have experienced some instances of harmful interference from boosters interacting with their networks. And as we all know, the primary objective of the FCC's wireless policy is to prevent harmful interference to spectrum licensees. <laughs> for these reasons, I vote to, in support of this order, which among other things sets forth rules for the authorized operation of consumer signal boosters and requires that consumer and industrial boosters are clearly labeled. Today's action should help American consumers benefit from boosters while ensuring that their neighbors continue to enjoy, re enjoy reliable service uh, and that wireless uh, service providers do not experience degradation to their networks. Now, as background, this proceeding has been far from simple or easy. Since 2007, when CTIA, the Wireless Association, 
filed a petition for declaratory ruling regarding the use of boosters in the uh, CMRS bans, the Commission has analyzed the sharp debate regarding the operation of consumer signal boosters. I would like to acknowledge and thank the wireless industry and signal booster manufacturers for coming together with a joint proposal for technical standards that will result in affordable and reliable consumer signal boosters that are unlikely to cause harmful interference. Private sector solutions are always preferable uh, over government mandates, which is the key reason why I'm supporting today's action. Although uh, the parties were able to reach consensus over technical standards, the Commission was left to resolve some remaining issues. A debate has ensued regarding carrier consent to signal boosters, registration and enforcement mechanisms, and the time frame for implementing the new standards. In creating a framework for authorized consumer signal booster use, this order tries to weigh the costs and benefits to the wireless industry, signal booster manufacturers, and, ultimately, consumers. For instance, in adopting a similar licensing model to uh, consumer handsets that operate on wireless networks, signal booster authorization will require provider consent and consumer device registration. Such requirements may be considered to be burdens by some. The largest wireless providers, however, have indicated that they will consent to the use of FCC certified signal boosters meeting the new technical standard on their networks. So not only will such requirements assist providers in correcting harmful interference should it occur, but they also ensure that wireless providers remain in control of their networks as required by Congress's intent as embodied in the Communications Act. I hope that uh, we achieved uh, the correct balance today. The Commission, however, has committed to review the technical standard, registration, and enforcement rules after two years to see if they should be modified or if there is room for improvement. Finally, I thank the Chairman uh, for incorporating uh, all these edits and my fellow Commissioners as well for all of their thoughtful input and edits and for engaging collegially on this matter, as we always do, and of course for our vaunted team of career uh, civil servants, engineers, economists, attorneys, and other professionals who have done an incredible uh, job. So thank you. Look forward to working with everybody on, on implementation of this. Thank you. Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to join you in welcoming our colleagues from the Hill uh, to the FCC. I, I must say, selfishly, it's better uh, to be on this campus than your campus, but uh, don't let your bosses know that I said that. Most of us have experienced an occasional drop call of slower than normal mobile broadband data speeds. But for millions, service interruptions or delays are more than rare, trivial annoyances. These American consumers, including businesses, have found it necessary to purchase wireless signal boosters in order to bridge gaps in communications service. Robust quality signal boosters have been properly narrowing service gaps without adverse consequences to wireless networks for many years. Unfortunately, there have been instances where technically deficient or improperly stalled, installed signal boosters have caused harmful interference to commercial and public safety wireless networks. In some cases, wireless companies have been forced to spend significant time and resources locating and eliminating booster-related interference. Balancing the needs of consumers who need single signal boosters with the interests of wireless carriers responsible for protecting the technical integrity of their networks has been very difficult. Some of the engineering and other technical issues have been challenging, and many parties took rather adversarial positions on legal and technical issues. But at the end of the day, a, single, a signal booster manufacturer and a licensed wireless service provider share the same goal, improving the ability of consumers to receive uninterrupted quality service from a licensed wireless network. I am pleased that the two sides were able to work past their differences and arrive at a solution that will benefit millions of Americans who clearly need single signal enhancement. Some of the procedural and technical rules we adopt for consumer signal boosters are based on a consolidated proposal agreed to by several signal booster manufacturers 
the four nationwide wireless service providers and over 90 small rural wireless service providers. They are designed to facilitate the development of safe, economical signal boosters, reduce consumer confusion, and encourage innovation in the booster market. Those who have closely followed this proceeding know that we began with a notice of proposed rulemaking that preferred what is known as a license by rule approach. Consumer advocates continue to assert that this approach would provide greater clarity to consumers and that going forward, they can purchase any use signal booster that meets the new network protection standards. I am voting to approve this item today because the order contains strong language that we will reconsider the license by rule approach if wireless carriers are unreasonably withholding their blanket authorizations. I wish to thank the chairman and my colleagues for working cooperatively to find common ground on this language. We also d adopt different but sensible rules for industrial signal boosters. These devices are typically designed to serve multiple users simultaneously and cover larger areas such as stadiums, airports, office buildings, and hospitals. They are high powered and may use a greater number of antennas, amplifiers, and other components. Given the characteristics of industrial boosters, this order reasonably requires greater coordination by the installer with the wireless service provider. I would like to especially thank my friend Ruth, Mil Ruth Milkman, John Leibowitz, Maria Kirby, Roger Noel, Joyce Jones, Tom Derringe, Becky Schwartz, and the other talented staff members in the Wireless Bureau, OET, the Public Safety Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau, OGC, and my colleagues, of course, for their patience and persistence in finding a mutually beneficial, workable solution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Well, let me also start by welcoming our guests from up on the hill. It was not too long ago that I served there in some capacity. So whether I'm a cautionary tale or a success story, I don't know. But uh, very much glad that you're here today and paying attention to the important work we do. According to the Centers for Disease Control, 41% of children live in households served only by wireless phones. One in three adults relies exclusively on wireless service at home. When a call is made to the doctor, to the workplace, to a child's school, and to 911, they trust that the call will go through. And they generally do. That is because carriers are working hard to improve the wireless customer experience and expand the edges of their network coverage. The reach of those networks, however, is not yet ubiquitous, and the experience is not always perfect. How do we know? The Pew Research Center's Internet and American Life Project tells us that 72% of cell phone owners experience drop calls, at least occasionally. But we also know from our own experience. I know, for instance, which parts of my home get only a single bar on my phone and which parts enjoy multiple bars. Getting a better signal is as simple as traversing from the kitchen to the living room. I would hazard to guess that there are others here, and even on this dais, who have had the same experience. And we live in a metropolitan area where coverage is generally excellent. Many rural consumers are not so lucky. Those who live on the remote end of a network may lose their signal when they stroll indoors or drive to the edge of their farm. But if they spend hundreds of dollars each year for wireless service, they should get full value for their hard-earned money. The best solution, by far, is encouraging carriers to continue to build out and upgrade networks. But that takes time, and that takes capital. So if the question is what we can do right now, one answer is the order on signal boosters that we adopt today. Historically, signal boosters have helped consumers extend their coverage of networks inside buildings and to rural, underserved, and hard-to-serve areas. Signal boosters have also helped first responders maintain connections in their vehicles. Unfortunately, however, shoddy devices can create more problems than they solve. 
by causing harmful interference, disrupting service to nearby wireless customers, and impeding the use of public safety networks. This is not acceptable. So today we put in place strict technical standards. They are designed to create immediate opportunities for extending service through quality signal boosters while curbing use of those who, that cause network harm. This means consumers who buy devices meeting our standards will be able to enjoy better wireless access without disrupting the service of their neighbors or the communications needs of first responders. Wireless carriers will also benefit as boosters extend the reach of their networks and reduce the number of dropped calls due to weak signals. This outcome is the byproduct of the cooperative work of carriers and booster manufacturers. We commend their efforts and thank them for their input. As a result, the Commission has been able to establish a process that obviates the need for a license by rule regime. But going forward, this agency must monitor the system we put in place. We should be on the lookout for further opportunities to streamline and improve this process, especially if unanticipated problems with approval or harmful interference occur. I know that today's decision is a team effort, so thank you to the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, our Office of Engineering and Technology, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, and Enforcement Bureau for all their work on this item. And I also want to thank the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau in anticipation of the work that they will need to do as a result of this order. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Pye. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to join the Chairman and my fellow Commissioners in welcoming our colleagues from Capitol Hill. Uh, like Commissioner Rosenworcel, I too was once a staffer many moons ago. And so uh, I bring a first-hand appreciation of uh, the difficulty of the challenges you face, the long hours, the complexity of the issues, uh, but also the benefits uh, that your public service brings to this country. So thank you for everything you do, and thank you in pr today for your interest in the FCC. If we can ever be of assistance, please feel free to call on the chairman anytime. <laughs> <laughs> and my fellow commissioners. And, uh, on a more serious note, uh, in November of 2007, wireless companies asked the FCC to address the use of signal boosters. Since then, consumers have purchased literally millions of boosters to improve wireless coverage, particularly in rural areas and indoor environments. But sometimes, these boosters also harmfully interfere with commercial and public safety networks. At this point, it's too late for us to put the genie back in the bottle. Instead, we have to focus on ensuring that new boosters entering the market do not cause harmful interference, and mitigating, as best we can, the problems caused by technically deficient boosters now in use. Today's item is, the is a product of compromise. So naturally, no stakeholder likes every single aspect of these rules. But I commend those carriers and booster manufacturers who came to the negotiating table in good faith and hammered out proposals that formed the basis of this morning's order. Because the rules we adopt today represent a plausible path forward, I'm voting to approve this item. Whether these rules ultimately work, however, will depend on how they are implemented. As they say, the proof will be in the pudding. I therefore want to set forth my expectations for what will happen following today's order. First, the carrier consent requirement should be implemented in a consumer-friendly manner. Some carriers have signaled that they will give blanket consent to all boosters that comply with our rules. Others may provide consent on a model-by-model -model basis. Either of these options, I believe, should work well. On the other hand, I don't expect carriers to require customers purchasing boosters to submit individual consent requests that would be evaluated on an individualized basis. Such a process would be inefficient for carriers and unnecessarily burdensome for consumers. Second, the Commission should keep close tabs on how well the registration mechanism works. Are boosters that are sold actually being registered? Is the registration system collecting enough information so for, to make it easier for both the Commission and carriers to resolve interference issues? These are just a few of the questions that we will need to ask. And I'm pleased that my colleagues agreed to the suggestion that I made, along with Commissioner McDowell, 
to review our registration requirements in a couple of years. Third, the Commission should enforce these rules in a firm but fair manner. If booster manufacturers put technically deficient uh, devices into the marketplace, we must act swiftly and impose tough penalties. On the other hand, we can't expect that every American who currently uses a booster will know that he or she must register that booster and obtain his or her carrier's consent. Indeed, I very much doubt that most individuals will learn about these requirements in the foreseeable future. For some reason, unbeknownst to me, most Americans don't watch FCC open meetings and they don't read FCC orders. So I therefore appreciate my colleagues' willingness to incorporate my suggestion that the Enforcement Bureau provide consumers who fail to register or to obtain consent for the use of a booster with a warning and an opportunity to shut down that booster before any forfeiture is imposed. This will help ensure that unsuspecting Americans won't be sanctioned as a result of our action today. Finally, like my colleagues, I would like to thank the staff of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau for all their hard work on this item in collaboration with staff from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, the Office of Engineering and Technology, the Office of General Counsel, and the Enforcement Bureau. The good news is that today's order is a significant accomplishment for which all of you deserve great credit. The bad news is that today's order creates even more work for you, especially for the engineers at the FCC lab in Columbia, whom I had the privilege of visiting two weeks ago, and who will soon be establishing new testing protocols and testing many boosters. I look forward to working with all of you in the months ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So while nearly the entire U.S. population is served by one or more wireless carriers, we have coverage gaps. Uh, dead spots within and at the edge of service areas. These can lead to dropped calls, to reduced data speeds, uh, or loss of service. Uh, and it's a particularly serious problem uh, as the percentage of Americans who rely only on wireless service at home crosses uh, one-third of the American population, as we've heard. Now, signal boosters do what their name implies. They amplify signals between wireless devices and wireless networks. They're a cost-effective means of expanding the reach of our nation's wireless infrastructure. Uh, individual consumers with uh, no technical experience, ex expertise can install signal boosters in their home, even in their cars. Now, this helps in both rural and urban areas. Uh, the problems are slightly different. In rural areas, uh, the challenge is that towers tend to be further apart. And so at the edges of those networks or in gaps in the networks, you can have this problem of uh, dead spots, drop calls. In urban areas, the problems are different. Uh, deep inside buildings, underground, uh, the walls and the buildings act uh, as a barrier. Now, signal boosters uh, can help address problems in both of these areas, and we know that because they're already doing so. In New York City, the Transit Authority is using signal boosters to enhance coverage in the subway system. In North Dakota, emergency personnel use signal boosters to facilitate communications on search and rescue operations in areas of challenging terrain. In Arizona, single signal boosters are used to improve wireless service on the Navajo Reservation. In small towns in southwestern Virginia, signal boosters increase signal strength by three times. The promise of signal boosters is clear. And as we've heard, some of the challenges of uh, consumer-driven con uh, signal boosters uh, are real, uh, interference challenges, public safety challenges. And so uh, as we develop the order that we approved today, we all recognize that it's critical to ensure that signal boosters not interfere with commercial networks, not interfere with public safety networks, uh, and to make sure that as we move forward and provide a runway for signal boosters, that we do it in a way uh, that guards against harmful interference. Uh, I'm pleased, as we all are, that uh, thanks to the terrific work uh, of, of the Bureau, um, uh, we've developed an approach that uh, I believe gets the balance right that gets signal boosters out there in more consumers' hand while also protecting uh, against interference. The clear rules of the road that we adopt today uh, will enhance wireless coverage in both rural and urban areas, will enhance public safety communications for consumers, 
they are a big part of our answer to the challenge of dead spots. Uh, so thank you to uh, uh, everyone on our staff uh, who's uh, worked uh, on this. At, uh, uh, as many of these things do, it seems simple as we explain it now, but we know that as you were working uh, through the details of how to do this, it's incredibly uh, complex from an engineering and a business perspective. And so I really thank you uh, for uh, driving this to simplicity. i uh, very grateful to my colleagues. Uh, uh, as another uh, order where we've had terrific uh, input and collaboration uh, from each of the commissioners. Uh, uh, it, this is a, uh, another example of something that, um, as we've all worked to develop an approach that meets the common sense test, um, uh, the uh, attention that this gets may be less than if we found a way to disagree, but the benefits to consumers in effectively and efficiently rolling out signal boosters and improving coverage and the benefits to uh, our networks, uh, carriers, and public safety community to do it in a way that guards against harmful interference are, are very real and will make a positive life, a positive difference in the lives of Americans every day. Uh, so with that, thank you all. And let's proceed to a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The uh, ayes have it, and the request for editorial privileges is granted. Uh, so thank you all very much. Excellent work. And with that, Madam Secretary, will you uh, announce our second agenda item? The next item on your agenda will be presented by the Office of Engineering and Technology. It is entitled, Revision of Part 15 of the Commission's Rules to Permit Unlicensed National Information Infrastructure Devices in the 5 Gigahertz Band. Terrific. Thank you. And, uh, Julie, whenever you're ready. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking before you proposes to increase the amount of spectrum for unlicensed wireless devices in the 5 gigahertz band and to improve access to the existing 5 gigahertz spectrum. The Commission's provisions for unlicensed devices have been a resounding success, sparking in innovative technologies and creating jobs. This NPRM would accelerate the growth and expansion of Wi-Fi technology and introduce a new generation of wider bandwidth and higher data rate devices that will offer consumers faster speeds and reduce congestion at Wi-Fi hotspots. The NPRM also provides a unique opportunity for the Commission to more fully study technologies and techniques that allow unlicensed devices to share spectrum with incumbent federal and non-federal services. I would like to thank the following OET staff who assisted in the preparation of today's NPRM, uh, Geraldine Mat Matisse, Mark Settle, Rashmi Doshi, Karen Ansari, uh, Aoli Wilkins, and Naveed Golshahi. I'd also like to thank uh, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the International Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau, and the Office of General Counsel for their assistance in preparing the item. With me at the table is Mark Settle, who is the Deputy Chief of OET's Policy and Rules Division, and Aoli Wilkins, who's an electronics engineer, and he'll be presenting the item. It's his inaugural presentation. Uh, we anticipate there will be many more to come. Aoli? Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Today's NPRM proposes to revise and streamline the Commission's Part 15 rules for unlicensed national information infrastructure devices, referred to as UNI devices, in the 5 gigahertz frequency band. UNI devices are unlicensed intentional radiators that currently operate over 555 megahertz of spectrum in the 5 gigahertz band. They're used for short-range, high-speed wireless connections, including Wi-Fi-enabled local area networks and fixed outdoor broadband transceivers used by wireless internet service providers to connect smartphones, tablets, and laptops to the broadband network. Existing UNI devices share spectrum on a non-interference basis with federal operations by using advanced techniques to avoid causing interference. For example, if a UNI device detects that a federal radar system is using the spectrum, the UNI device automatically shifts to another part of the spectrum that is unoccupied at that location. The FCC is working with the National Telecommunications and Information Administration and all stakeholders, including federal agencies and the private sector, to determine the ability of these or other 
similar advanced sharing techniques to provide access to additional spectrum for uni devices in the 5 gigahertz band. We believe such sharing is possible and it would increase the amount of 5 gigahertz spectrum available to uni devices by 195 megahertz or 35%. The, uh, the additional spectrum is significant because it would allow uni devices to employ wider bandwidths and faster speeds up to one gigabit per second, and it would allow more users to access Wi-Fi hotspots simultaneously, relieving congestion at places such as airports and conventions, and it would expand opportunities for innovation in new broadband applications. The existing uni rules break up the spectrum into several blocks, each with its own set of requirements. The NPRM proposes to make the rules more consistent so that new technologies that employ wide bandwidths have greater flexibility to operate across all parts of the spectrum. The proposed rules would also provide a simpler, more streamlined equipment certification process than exists today. This change would reduce the administrative burdens and costs associated with device certification as fewer variations and testing procedures are needed. The NPRM also proposes measures to improve compliance. For example, the NPRM would require that manufacturers take reasonable measures to ensure that third parties cannot easily disable or modify the software that controls the UNI device, which is key to avoiding interference. And last, but certainly not least, the NPRM satisfies the requirements of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012, which charges the Commission to, to begin a proceeding to allow uni devices to operate on additional spectrum in the 5 gigahertz band. The office recommends adoption of the notice of proposed, rule make, proposed rulemaking and we request editorial privileges. Thank you. Excellent work on this. Thank you very much. Commissioner McDowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last night I had the privilege of attending the National Academy of Engineering awards ceremony. Uh, now, there is no Nobel Prize for engineering, so uh, these awards are intended to fill that gap. Including in the amazing array of honorees was my friend Marty Cooper, the inventor of the cell phone. Also in attendance was Dr. Robert Kahn, whom I've also gotten to know over the years. Dr. Kahn is the co-inventor of TCP IP, the protocol that allows the Internet to work. It ends up that Marty Cooper and Bob Kahn were fans of each other but had never before met. So last night I had the incredible honor of being able to introduce them to each other. Although I still haven't recovered from the awe of the moment where an internet pioneer met the father of the cell phone, quite literally the personification of the internet meeting mobility, I was able to ask each of them at once whether at the time of their inventions had they foreseen the incredible effect their work would have on the human condition. And with characteristic honesty and humility, they both said no. Now the point for all of us to learn from these great minds is that none of us None of us can guess what innovations may be coming over the horizon or their potential to improve the lives of all human beings. Liberal arts majors who make public policy, such as myself, should learn to exercise regulatory humility and allow engineers to have the freedom to experiment. I'm hopeful that this proceeding does just that. Marty's and Bob's inventions, by the way, are doing just fine. In fact, in 2012, U.S. mobile data traffic reached 207 petabytes per month, a 62% increase over the previous year. To put this amazing growth into context, processing 207 petabytes per month is equivalent to watching 52 million DVDs per month or sending 570 million text messages each second over our wireless networks. And mobile usage will only continue to surge well into the future. It is estimated that mobile data traffic will grow ninefold in the next five years. 
Furthermore, wireless devices are proliferating at an unprecedented rate. 51 million new devices were connected to U.S. mobile networks in the last year alone, uh, bringing the total of American mobile-enabled devices to 424 million, roughly. It is estimated that 775 million wirelessly connected devices will be used by Americans by the year 2017. So to relieve congested cell networks, consumers are choosing to move wireless data to unlicensed systems. Last year, 96% of U.S. uh, traffic associated with portable devices was carried on Wi-Fi networks at some point. Not only does this percentage include data that originated on Wi-Fi systems, but also the 47% of mobile data that was offloaded from cellular to Wi-Fi networks. So what does all this mean? The spectrum that is used for unlicensed Wi-Fi is also experiencing congestion, which will only increase in the coming years if we do not make appropriate bands, like the 5 gigahertz band, more attractive for investment and innovation. Accordingly, I'm I'm pleased to vote in support of this notice, which initiates the review of the current requirements and takes steps to increase the amount of spectrum available for unlicensed Uh, for unlicensed use in the 5 gigahertz band. Our proposal, uh, proposals to harmonize the rules and requirements across the 5 gigahertz band will make this spectrum more attractive to investors and innovators by providing certainty and consistency across a wide swath of spectrum. This initiative, combined with the proposal to permit unlicensed use on an additional 195 megahertz of spectrum, will make the 5 gigahertz band more attractive for the deployment of faster, more robust Wi-Fi networks using the latest industry standards that provide the greatest efficiencies on 80 to 160 megahertz slices of spectrum. I'm also pleased that we specifically see comment on international efforts to harmonize uses of the 5 gigahertz band. Launching this proceeding is just the beginning, of course, and we have a lot of work ahead of us. Federal and non-federal primary users are prevalent throughout the 5 gigahertz band, both in the bands where unlicensed use is already permitted and in in the 195 megahertz of spectrum we hope to open to such use. Today, we take the initial steps to fulfill Congress's mandate in the Spectrum Act that we, along with NTIA, look into opening certain 5 gigahertz frequencies for unlicensed use. Although we seek comment on protecting incumbent licensees from harmful interference, the Commission, affected government agencies, Wi-Fi providers, and others will have to work together to ensure the successful unlicensed deployment in the spectrum. Although allowing unlicensed use in an additional 195 megahertz of spectrum will promote continued innovation and investment in unlicensed devices and wireless broadband systems, it does not mean that we can be complacent and stop advocating for additional federal spectrum to be auctioned for exclusive use licenses. The federal government, specifically the executive branch, needs to evaluate its spectrum usage with the goal of relinquishing bandwidth for exclusive and flexible private sector uses. Spectrum sharing and the auctioning of exclusive use licenses are not equivalent. So I thank the chairman for prioritizing this very important proceeding and also the amazing engineers that we have here at OET, at the FCC. Uh, You are among the finest in the world and you all also deserve some National Academy of Engineering recognition, but there's not much I can do about it. We have to talk to the National Academy of Science. But um, last night really, Uh, refreshed uh, my sense that we need to do more to recognize the engineers uh, of our great nation. Uh, While entertainers and sports figures uh, make life fun, engineers actually improve the human condition in so many ways. And uh, thank you for all you do to help make that happen. Thank you. Commissioner Kleiber. Thank you. In his State of the Union address, President Obama spoke of a smarter government that sets priorities and invests in broad-based growth. Our first priority, he said, 
should be making America a magnet for new jobs in manufacturing. Without a doubt, the wireless service industry is one sector where smart policy can promote tremendous growth. One wireless analyst stated that in 2011, this industry was responsible for creating 3.8 million jobs, or 2.6 percent of all domestic employment. According to other reports, this relatively young sector now contributes more to our nation's GDP than the agriculture, hotels and lodging, air transportation, and motor vehicle manufacturing industries. In light of all the wireless, brings, wireless industry brings to our economy, promoting growth in this sector can greatly advance the President's domestic policy goals. Under Chairman Janikowski's leadership, the Commission has been adopting innovative policies to promote broader deployment and adoption of mobile broadband services. These include the, the data roaming order, the TV white spaces proceeding, the interoperability in a lower 700 megahertz band proceeding, M Health initiatives, and the Learning on the Go pilot program. This proceeding to promote unlicensed services in the 5 gigahertz band is another prime example of how smart government policy can advance growth in the wireless industry and the overall economy. When the FCC first allocated unlicensed spectrum in the 1980s, it was primarily used for cordless phones, baby monitors, and garage door openers. Then Wi-Fi hit the scene, and the demand has been off the charts. In 2005, tens of millions of Wi-Fi devices were sold globally. In 2011, at least 150 million of those devices were sold only in the U.S. Unlicensed Wi-Fi offload is now an integral part of the way mobile carriers deliver their services. In that same year, 2011, Consumer Federation of America found that Wi-Fi offload allows wireless carriers to save more than $25 billion per year in deployment costs. According to some commenters, the annual contribution of the unlicensed wireless sector to our nation's economy is estimated to be more than $50 billion per year. The nation's demand for unlicensed services has increased so dramatically that we need more spectrum to support these services. The 2.4 gigahertz ban, while critical to the success of Wi-Fi and other unlicensed technologies, is increasingly congested, particularly in major cities. Densely populated centers are the most expensive geographic areas to deploy licensed networks. Therefore, I commend the staff for recommending rule proposals that could make up to an additional 195 megahertz of spectrum available for unlicensed services. I hope commenters will provide us with thoughtful, detailed recommendations on how we can adopt technical rules that will create incentives for the industry to make the most efficient use of this spectrum. As the item points out, there are a number of technical issues to be resolved, and we will have to coordinate with NTIA on the impact of these proposed rules on federal users in the 5 gigahertz band. But it is important that we get started on resolving these issues right away. The sooner we resolve these issues, the sooner American innovation can show leadership in developing this ban for unlicensed services. Special thanks are due to Julie Knapp, Mark Settle, Aoli Wilkins, looking forward to seeing more of you again, great job, and the other talented members of OET, the Enforcement International and Wireless Bureaus, for presenting us with such an excellent notice for proposed rulemaking. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Look around. The wireless devices we pull to our ears, place in our pockets, tap on our laps, read with at night, and hover over our desks at day. They are multiplying. We own more of them, do more with them, and power more aspects of our lives with them than ever before. We are a nation whose every day depends on wireless connectivity. It is an essential part of our economic and civic life. 
So it is no surprise that the demand for our airwaves is growing at a fast clip. But it is important to remember that the speed with which we face demand for our spectrum is not confined to licensed wireless services. Congestion in our unlicensed spectrum bands is fast approaching a breaking point, too. So why does this coming crush in unlicensed spectrum matter? For starters, the unlicensed economy represents economic growth. Today, unlicensed wireless devices contribute between 16 and $37 billion to our economy annually. To put that in perspective, that is more than Americans spend on milk and bread each year combined. The unlicensed economy also represents innovation. Countless innovations that have made our lives easier and more convenient every day are dependent on unlicensed spectrum. If you have ever called on a cordless phone, changed the channel with a television remote, or pushed the button on a garage door opener, you have benefited from the power of unlicensed technology. The unlicensed economy also represents a critical pathway for internet connectivity. Today, more than one-third of wireless data connections are offloaded onto unlicensed spectrum. Most of that traffic uses the 2.4 gigahertz band, which is also the home of countless other wireless devices, like cordward, cordless phones, microphones, microwave ovens, and Bluetooth. Although the 2.4 gigahertz band continues to serve us well, it is growing mighty crowded. So it is no wonder that the search is on to find more spectrum for unlicensed services. It is a search that this commission needs to support, consistent with the law, because good spectrum policy requires both licensed and unlicensed services across multiple spectrum bands. The proposals we make in this rulemaking regarding the 5 gigahertz band are good first steps. These are ideas that can mean new near-term opportunities for unlicensed and long-term possibilities for expanding unlicensed down the road. So let's start with what we can do today. This rulemaking explores how to synchronize the varying technical restrictions in place throughout the 5 gigahertz band while still respecting existing government and commercial users. Now, in practice, this means working to expand to more 5 gigahertz frequencies the kind of flexible rules that have been the script for an unlicensed success story in the 5.725 to 5.825 gigahertz band. As a result of these flexible rules, cable operators right now use this band to offer Wi-Fi services at hotspots in their franchise areas allowing consumers to take their broadband with them when they leave the house. This means consumers can save money and reduce congestion on licensed wireless networks. So we should explore whether or not restrictions impeding the expansion of unlicensed and other 5 gigahertz bands are still necessary. At the same time, this investigation can include asking whether parts of the 5 gigahertz band are appropriate for other federal services. But once those questions are answered, we should not hesitate to remove limitations that are no longer needed. So fast forward from what we can do right now to what we may be able to do down the road. Consistent with the direction from Congress and the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act, we are proposing to make an additional 195 megahertz in the 5 gigahertz band available for unlicensed use. These airwaves can be a colossal catalyst for new innovation because it features enough continuous spectrum to unlock the full potential of a new Wi-Fi standard, 802.11ac. Undoubtedly, cool new ways of connecting await. But as enticing as it is to be swept away by that future promise, we are going to have to deal with some present realities. These 195 megahertz are occupied by federal users. The National Telecommunications and Information Administration reports that additional testing of this spectrum will take at least until the end of 2014. Plus, the types of uses that have been proposed in this spectrum will require resources like new databases, dynamic frequency selection, and transmit power control. 
In short, finding ways to share this 195 megahertz of spectrum without interfering with critical government missions may take a long time. So I think it's necessary to start identifying ways to accelerate this process by incentivizing federal authorities to be more efficient with spectrum right now. To do this, we are going to have to look for ways that federal users can realize value from using spectrum efficiently instead of only seeing loss from its commercial reallocation. These incentives do not need to be purely financial, and the rewards do not have to come directly from the spectrum rights being released. Instead, the incentives can come from benefits and appropriations, budgeting, or through structured use of synthetic currency, as proposed by the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. When it comes to transitioning spectrum from strictly federal to new or shared commercial use, we need not only use sticks. We should explore carrots. I think the latter is bound to facilitate more opportunity in the 5 gigahertz spectrum and beyond. Given the multiplying number of wireless devices in our lives and the growing demands on our airwaves, licensed and unlicensed, now is not a moment too soon. Thank you to the Office of Engineering and Technology for your terrific work on this rulemaking and your, your great and uncommon dedication to these issues. Thank you. Commissioner Pai. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Flexible and licensed spectrum use was one of the FCC's great innovations in the 1980s. The Commission expanded several so-called junk bans to permit additional unlicensed uses and streamlined the Part 15 rules accordingly. They are junk no more. Unlicensed spectrum in the 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz bands is now some of the most valuable spectrum in the world for broadband. And consumers are the ultimate beneficiaries of unlicensed use technologies such as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Millions of Americans rely on Wi-Fi every day uh, when they boot up their laptops, they connect with their smartphones, and they use their tablets on the Internet. And in the words of the Big Bang Theory's Sheldon Cooper, everything is better with Bluetooth. What excites me about today's notice of proposed rulemaking is that we are building on these past successes and using spectrum ideally suited for unlicensed use. The short-range propagation characteristics of 5 gigahertz spectrum enable localized reuse with minimal risk of interference. The next generation Wi-Fi standard IEEE 802.11ac will be finalized soon. And enhancing the contiguity and the size of 5 gigahertz blocks contemplated in the item should allow wider channels for higher bandwidth transmissions. For example, a 160 megahertz wide channel could deliver one gigabit of data per second. That's super Wi-Fi. I'm most pleased that today we are teeing up the expansion of unlicensed use by a full 195 megahertz in the 5 gigahertz band, consistent with my suggestions since last October. I give the, credit great chair, uh, the chairman great credit. We weren't obligated to go this far. The Spectrum Act only required that we commence a proceeding on opening up 120 megahertz. But taking this step just makes sense. More Spectrum will allow higher speed, higher capacity connections, and will mean less congestion in apartment buildings and coffee shops, in libraries and offices across this country. For all these reasons, putting these bands to better commercial use could have tremendous benefits. Now, to be sure, achieving this vision will not be without its challenges. The statute lets us expand unlicensed use into the 5350 to 5470 megahertz band only if we determine that, and I quote, licensed users will be protected by technical solutions, including the use of existing, modified, or new spectrum sharing technologies and solutions, unquote. Additionally, we must find, and I quote again, the primary mission of federal spectrum users will not be compromised by the introduction of unlicensed devices. To help us in making these determinations, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration 
has reported on the potential impacts to federal government users from expanding unlicensed use. And I, of course, appreciate NTIA's work. But Congress gave the FCC the ultimate responsibility, so I look forward to reviewing comments with an open mind. Given the wide swaths of spectrum already allocated to the federal government, I hope that we will consider whether federal users should alter their systems or operations to accommodate unlicensed devices or uh, in the spectrum, and what solutions will work, keeping in mind the costs and benefits of all potential options. Today's notice is just the beginning of what will be, I'm sure, a highly technical process. Suffice it to say that the FCC could not proceed without the able support of the Office of Engineering and Technology, especially Julie Knapp, Aoli Wilkins, Mark Settle, uh, Reshmi Doshi, Geraldine Matisse, Karen Ansari, Bruce Romano, and Naveed Gulchai. Uh, thanks to all of you for your work on this item and for the work you do each day to advance the FCC's mission. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, most everyone in this room or watching at home has had direct experience with the problem we're seeking to solve. You're at an airport, you're at a convention, you're in a hotel, and you break out your laptop or your tablet or your smartphone hoping to get a Wi-Fi connection, and you see the, uh, uh, the Wi-Fi router signal there, and you think, great, I can get online. And then moments later, you're saying, not so fast, literally. Wi-Fi congestion is a very real and growing problem. We see it in our daily lives. Like license spectrum, demand for unlicensed spectrum threatens to outpace supply. Now, this is a uh, consequence of a good news story. Uh, we're seeing tremendous demand for data, uh, both for licensed use and unlicensed use. Uh, this is a good thing because it's driving new innovation, new products, new services, economic growth, job creation, new healthcare-related applications, education applications. So this is all good. But it's creating a problem that several years ago no one anticipated, that the demand would be rising at such a high level that all of a sudden this vast expanse of our airwaves would start seeming very small because demand is going up not at 10% or 20% or even 100%, but as, have we, as we've heard, uh, 1,000%. Um, we're also seeing, as we've heard, um, very smart steps being taken to offload the demand from our commercial networks onto our unlicensed infrastructure. Cisco estimates that commercial wireless networks are already offloading 33% of all traffic to Wi-Fi and project that offloading will grow to 46% by 2017. This is a very, very good thing. It wasn't something that was anticipated when Wi-Fi came along. And of course, Wi-Fi wasn't anticipated when unlicensed came along. Um, but it's a very good thing. And while Wi-Fi offload is part of the solution to the problem of congested cellular networks, Wi-Fi's popularity is creating now congestion issues of its own. And Wi-Fi congestion isn't just a problem at airports or public venues. Uh, it's becoming a problem at home. We're in the early stage of this, but it will only get worse because it's increasingly common in homes to have multiple data-hungry devices, tablets and other devices, using Wi-Fi at the same time. Our current Wi-Fi infrastructure, including Spectrum, wasn't designed for this. Now, it, for the past few years, the FCC has been pursuing a strong agenda to free up more Spectrum for licensed and unlicensed use. Uh, we have been and we will continue to be relentless when it comes to this because we see every day the growing gap between data demand and the supply of spectrum available. And we know from our experience that both expanding the amount of spectrum for uh, auctions of licensed use and expanding the amount of spectrum for unlicensed use has to be uh, major parts of the solution. Uh, we will continue to lean into every idea to free up more spectrum for both licensed and unlicensed use. This is why 
we have spent so much of our time together working on these issues. It's uh, what led us to develop the pioneering concept of incentive auctions, uh, which Congress, to its great credit, uh, adopted, and we're now moving forward at the agency to implement it, uh, a world-leading policy uh, that will enable the U.S. to free up spectrum for auction and on license use faster than any other country in the world. This is one of only uh, several next-generation spectrum policies that we're pursuing. We've talked about uh, spectrum sharing. Uh, we've talked about next generation on license. Uh, as part of the incentive auction proceeding, as I mentioned, we're both moving to free up a very significant amount of spectrum for licensed use and create next generation unlicensed use in low band contiguous spectrum. When um, uh, Wi-Fi uh, uh, first came along, uh, the, the idea at the FCC wasn't let's invent Wi-Fi. The idea was, as some of my colleagues mentioned, we have a band that we can't figure out what to allocate. This is back in the days when the FCC uh, did command and control allocations. And uh, Julie, one of your predecessors, uh, said, well, why don't we just put it on the market for unlicensed use? The FCC decided to do that, not knowing what exactly it would lead to, uh, not calling it what it became, which was a platform for innovation. And so that decision gave us, uh, as we've heard, uh, garage door openers and um, uh, cordless phones and Bluetooth and eventually Wi-Fi. And, uh, and, uh, and as we know, uh, Wi-Fi has added such tremendous value to our economy and society, uh, spurring uh, job creation, economic growth, hundreds of billions of dollars of value creation for our economy and consumers, resulting in billions of dollars of revenue to the Treasury. So on the unlicensed side, we need to do a couple of things. Uh, we need to pursue uh, this next generation, a new platform for innovation, which we're looking at in the incentive auction proceeding. This proceeding is about uh, nurturing existing Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi as we know it. We all know how much value it's adding every day to our lives and our economy. We know that we are facing spectrum congestion issues when it comes to Wi-Fi, and so we know that we have to do something about it. Uh, and uh, our engineers and others who have looked at the landscape for expanding spectrum for additional Wi-Fi have identified this spectrum as the most promising solution. And it's why uh, all of us together uh, are uh, working to move forward expeditiously uh, on this proposal. Um, as you've heard, the proposal that we will vote on today would increase and free up the unlicensed spectrum available for Wi-Fi. Uh, it would enable what people in the space call gigabit Wi-Fi. The big large channels available in the next generation of routers will enable uh, super fast Wi-Fi exchanges of information uh, wherever Wi-Fi is available. We're proposing to uh, add 195 megahertz to Wi-Fi from the 5 gigahertz band. This would increase the 5 gigahertz spectrum available for Wi-Fi by 35%. Uh, this would be the largest block of unlicensed spectrum to be made available for Wi-Fi since 2003. Uh, this would have uh, the enormous benefits that I have mentioned. Uh, as we move forward, uh, of course, we are aware that the 5 gigahertz band, in particular the spectrum that we have identified, is already being used for other purposes by both federal and non-federal users. Uh, uh, this is true of virtually all the other bands where Wi-Fi is used. It is not a new challenge for the Commission to address. Uh, this effort with respect to this 200 megahertz, 195, will require significant consultation with stakeholders to enable non-interfering shared use of the spectrum. Again, we've done this before. The Wi-Fi spectrum crunch is so significant that consultation can't be an excuse for inaction or delay. Uh, all of us involved in this must be guided by the President's directive to free up spectrum for commercial use, and by the critical importance of increasing the availability of spectrum to drive economic growth, job creation, and our country's global competitiveness. These are common goals. These are goals we all share. 
we are committed to uh, a process of consultation. We are committed to moving expeditiously to free up additional spectrum. We look forward to working with all government and non-government uh, stakeholders and to delivering to the public this grant of new spectrum for Wi-Fi that will improve wireless broadband service all over the country. Uh, Julie, let me join my colleagues in thanking each of you up here uh, for working on this. I know you've been working on this uh, for quite some time, and you've done really excellent work. I want to join my colleagues in uh, commending the work of our engineers at the FCC. Uh, um, uh, there's no uh, non-complex issue that we address in this area, and the quality of work that we consistently get from uh, OET and the engineers at the FCC uh, is something that we're all proud of. Uh, of course, other bureaus have been involved in, uh, in this uh, item as well, the Wireless Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau, the International Bureau, the General Counsel's Office. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thanks, Renee Gregory, in my office, who's been working very, very hard on this. And I want to thank uh, each of my colleagues. Uh, we've made uh, tremendous progress uh, on uh, wireless policy and initiatives uh, over the last few years, uh, and that can only happen at a commission uh, that's uh, working together uh, and committed to uh, the vision and the opportunity of unleashing spectrum for our economy and the American people. Uh, so with that, let me ask for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and the request for editorial privileges is granted. Um, so thank you very much. You're welcome to stay or go. And uh, let me just ask if any of my colleagues have any personal or personnel announcements today, a no and a no, and a no and a no. Uh, I've got a no. Absolutely nothing. It's unanimous. <laughs> really nothing. Uh, so with that, uh, Madam Secretary, would you please announce the date of the next commission meeting? The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Wednesday, March 20th, 2013. Great. Thank you. We are adjourned. We're ready if you could gather, please, the chairman's press conference. How are you? Let me get up here. You have Monopoly today. Not me. All right, now it's, it's a duopoly. And if I could just remind you, if you could just identify your outlet, um, state your name, and just restrict to uh, one question, please. Okay, Ed, would you like to... Sorry, Gabe, would you like to start? Uh, someone else can start. <laughs> Do you, can I start? Sure. Um, so on the booster item, you and others said it's a balanced approach. You kind of considered the, the various issues. Um, the public interest folks and the booster makers had said you shouldn't require carrier consent. You should basically, at the very least, it should be a presumption um, that that if, they, if the technical standards are followed, that it should be allowed. I guess I just wanted to see if you had any more, if you could elaborate a little more on why there should be carrier consent. Some of the booster folks said that you all were worried that you didn't have the authority to say to the carriers, you must allow this, rather than making it voluntary on the carrier part. As, as I think you saw, what uh, one of the things that helped facilitate um, uh, an outcome here was the commitment by a number of carriers to provide uh, that consent. Uh, our goal is to uh, put in place clear rules of the road that uh, enable and authorize signal boosters out there for consumers as quickly as possible, but as part of a framework that protects against interference. So as we looked at it, we all said, you know what, this is uh, the fastest way to get from A to B. Uh, meanwhile, as you also heard today, we're going to monitor this, uh, and if we expect it to work, um, uh, but we haven't ruled out any options for the future if for some reason it doesn't. Hi, Chairman. Uh, Paul Barbagallo with BNA. Uh, a question regarding the agency's uh, gigabit city challenge. Yeah. Um, are you planning to take any actions um, 
here at the FCC to speed the creation of, of uh, gigabit cities. And can you elaborate on what you're advising cities and localities? Sure. The first thing I'd like to point out is that we have been uh, taking actions to promote uh, gigabit rollout, fiber rollout, super fast rollout from the day that I got here. Now, most of these things uh, um, are kind of the plumbing of what we do, but they matter to the companies that are looking at uh, the costs and the ease of building out. So whether it's something like our pole attachment order, which lowered the cost and provided clarity for uh, ISPs to run fiber over utility poles, uh, or the uh, Dig Once initiative that we developed in the broadband plan and that last year the president signed into an executive order, uh, also lowering the cost of building out fiber-based networks by essentially encouraging uh, um, the laying of fiber anytime a road is being repaired. There are a bunch of other uh, initiatives uh, that were combined with that. Uh, things like, again, another area that uh, on one hand isn't exciting, but on the other hand makes a big difference. The major reforms we did on intercarrier compensation, uh, reducing uh, and ultimately eliminating the disincentives to build out uh, digital IP networks. So uh, we continue to uh, uh, pursue ideas like that. Uh, an idea that we're actively working on now is the creation of a data warehouse of best practices for local communities that are interested in building out gigabit connectivity. Uh, so the good news in the country is that we are now, you know, no longer at zero communities with a gigabit. We have Kansas City, we have Chattanooga, we have uh, uh, a number of other communities. And um, as parts of those processes, uh, we're all learning about ways that uh, local governments can work uh, with ISPs or adjust their processes to lower the cost, speed the build out, make it uh, more economically rational to do one gigabit. And one of the things we want to do is to take those best ideas and make them easily accessible to communities all over the country, because why would we want to have different communities reinvent the wheel uh, every time? Uh, the other thing, you may have seen a statement I issued, uh, I guess, uh, before the weekend on uh, uh, um, municipal, uh, uh, exactly. You know, that's another area that we identified early on in the National Broadband Plan. So it's a pretty full bucket of activities. We're going to have a hearing soon. I don't know if it's been scheduled, uh, but the purpose of that hearing is to look at the things we've done, uh, talk about how we can improve them. Uh, what other ideas can we pursue to encourage gigabit communities? And I, uh, I think you also asked why this initiative. Uh, and the short answer is I believe that we need in the U.S. a critical mass of communities um, with one gigabit connectivity so that one gigabit-based innovation happens in the U.S. and not in another country. Other countries are looking at this. Um, one community alone or two community alones isn't enough to draw uh, capital and interest of innovators. We need to get to a critical mass. And so the goal that, that I laid out was um, a gigabit community in every state uh, in the country. But the focus I want to keep is on let's get to a critical mass of a market for one gigabit connectivity uh, we will see incredible innovation if we do that. That innovation will translate into jobs, economic growth, and exports for the U.S. Brooks Ball, oh, hello. Brooks Ball Politico. I'm hesitant to use my one question on a parochial issue, but I'm going to go ahead. What's going on with our frequent flyer passes? It's harder to get in here than the Capitol. Mine's going to expire soon. <laughs> you know, it's... Your hallmark of your administration has been transparency. Those of us that are the eyes and ears of the public need access. So tell me what's going on there. You know, I think uh, I'll give you another question because I don't know the answer. But we'll, <laughs> we, will, we will get you an answer because we are uh, committed to uh, frequent flyer points for all our uh, uh, our frequent visitors. So I, I, all right. Uh, th thanks for the second one. Uh, is, right. is there a concern at, about on the uh, Wi-Fi on the 5 gigs that um, the spectrum will get used up by – Entities like the cable uh, industry where you have to pay a subscription to access Wi-Fi, or is the idea so that it's like free Wi-Fi for everybody, yay? 
Well, the wonderful thing about uh, an unlicensed spectrum regime is that anyone has access to it. And it encourages lots of different uh, business models and experiments uh, and approaches. Uh, and we don't have to be in the business of dictating uh, a business model. So, uh, 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 you know, moving forward, this, to me, this is an easy one. Actually, most of these are easy ones, I think. But uh, we know how valuable Wi-Fi uh, is. We know it from our everyday lives. We've identified spectrum that could make a big positive difference in reducing congestion, starting now at large venues, but ultimately in the homes. And, uh, and I think you saw unanimous commission today saying we've got to lean into this and move as quickly as possible uh, on it. Uh, hi, Mr. Chairman. Todd Shields, Bloomberg News. What do you say to the auto industry, which fears that the Wi-Fi expansion or the prospective Wi-Fi expansion voted today will interfere with the so-called driverless car and wireless uh, avoid, uh, collision avoidance systems? So as you also heard today, uh, virtually every Wi-Fi band that's in use now, if not every one, is also used by other services. And so this work of making sure that Wi-Fi spectrum can be available, for that spectrum can be available for Wi-Fi in ways that are compatible, that don't interfere with other uses, is something that uh, the Commission has done many, many, many times uh, over the years. Uh, this is one of the challenges that we certainly have to work out. It's not a challenge that's different in kind from the other challenges uh, in the space. Uh, Julie can explain, uh, Julie Knapp can explain a little bit more about why, but essentially uh, uh, it uses um, uh, basic Wi-Fi um, uh, concepts in the way that service is provided. So our engineers here are very confident that as these issues have been worked through many, many, many times in the past, um, uh, uh, it'll be worked through here as well. Hi, Alina Selyuk with Reuters. Uh, to follow up on that, what are the chances or what is your willingness or possibility that you guys would um, sort of backtrack on the amount of spectrum you're looking at freeing up or the particular bands, um, the particular frequencies you're looking at? Well, this uh, proposal today is based on a tremendous amount of engineering work uh, done uh, by the engineers at our agency. Uh, uh, and so we, we don't now see any reason why we can't put 195 new megahertz of spectrum for unlicensed on the market and do it in a way uh, uh, that's compatible with other existing uses. Um, so, so, so we don't see uh, uh, any likelihood of having it be less uh, spectrum. Uh, the, the, the way these issues tend to get resolved is um, uh, uh, through various um, uh, technical means of identifying conflicting uses and resolving them. I encourage you to ask uh, our engineers about that because they can go a few levels uh, deeper. Uh, uh, the other thing I'd say is... Um, as you can infer from the uh, data usage statistics that almost every commissioner mentioned today, um, this isn't the end of our work. It's not the end of our work to identify spectrum that we can free up. Uh, it's not the end of our work to identify spectrum that we can share. It's not the end of our work to identify ways that we can incentivize new technologies that drive more efficient use of the spectrum. Uh, as I tried to say, this is largely a good news story because the reason we're all struggling with this is the U.S. is leading the world in mobile. Uh, we're uh, ahead of the rest of the world in rolling out 4G LTE at scale. Uh, mobile innovation in the U.S. is the envy of the rest of the world. This is all great. It's resulting in uh, unprecedented data use. All of that uses our spectrum uh, and so just as we're leading the world now in mobile innovation and mobile infrastructure and the economic and social benefits of mobile, we have to lead the world in mobile policy uh, to make sure that these opportunities don't run into a wall. Ed? Hi, Ed Wyatt in the New York Times. What is your current thinking on how long you'll remain as chairman, and do you think it'll be say, through the time that the spectrum auction rules are 
uh, finalized? So, Ed, I, I, I answered this question uh, uh, last week by referring to a – or last uh, time by referring to a uh, – a lunch reservation that I had. Uh, people keep on asking these questions, and it's starting to hurt my uh, my feelings. So uh, I, I don't have anything to add to what I've said uh, in the past on this. But if you'd like to ask another question, you're welcome to. The uh, NTIA raised, I mean, in addition to groups like the automobile industry, the NTIA raised some very specific uh, military and uh, similar uh, uh, FAA and other uses uh, concerns about uh, this 5 gigahertz spectrum. Uh, how are you going to I mean, deal with with those issues specifically? The, the, the ways that we have in the past, as I mentioned, uh, um, yeah, every band where Wi-Fi is used, uh, let me just say virtually every, and I'll let Julie be more specific, uh, is also used by other services, both governmental and non-governmental. Uh, this is what the engineers of the FCC do. This is what the engineers at the other government agencies do um, uh, uh, it, it's very important for the country that we all uh, lean into this in a problem-solving way. Uh, and I have to say, I think over the last um, uh, six to nine months, we've seen uh, a number of important examples by government agencies with Spectrum uh, leaning into new ideas for freeing up spectrum uh, and sharing spectrum. Uh, an example is um, the experimental uh, test testing that is in process in the 1.7 gigahertz band uh, to determine uh, the best way to share spectrum around Air Force and other bases that uh, use a particular spectrum in parts of the country but where the spectrum can be freed up in the rest of the country. And similarly, in uh, 3.5 gigahertz, where uh, we're looking to open that up for commercial use as a small cell band, um, we've seen uh, other government agencies um, in uh, a productive and promising way work with us to move forward on these ideas. And I think part of the reason that it's happening is everyone recognizes that these are uh, fundamental uh, economic competitiveness and growth issues for the U.S. Um, but I think uh, people in different government agencies uh, are recognizing that there are benefits to all of the government agencies from working together on these kinds of ideas. And the reason is there's a, a growing uh, gap between uh, military communications equipment and commercial communications equipment, a gap as measured by functionality and price. And it's in all of our interest to close that gap. It's not going to be closed by slowing down commercial innovation. One of the ways to close that gap is by increasing um, the commercial government cooperation, particularly among the innovators uh, in the space. And uh, uh, I, I've heard this from a number of people I've spoken with uh, in other government agencies. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing uh, more and more uh, faster um, action to test out these ideas, to move forward on ways to uh, enable sharing of spectrum for both commercial and other uses. And of course, what we're talking about uh, in this 5 gigahertz band is fundamentally a sharing uh, idea, as it is in all of the Wi-Fi bands. Hi, uh, Gabe Nelson from Automotive News. You've already addressed your, your approach to the auto industry's issue there, but I just had a, I was wondering, have you uh, spoken with your counterparts over at the uh, Department of Transportation? It's, uh, uh, they're obviously very bullish on that technology and would like to see it proceed. Yes, our staff, uh, I'm sure, has been in touch with them. Uh, and uh, as in the other areas I mentioned, uh, we're confident that there is a, a path to compatibility uh, and where making the spectrum available uh, for Wi-Fi and for those services on a shared basis uh, is uh, well within the realm of possibility and consistent with other examples of sharing in the past. And I encourage you to ask um, our folks from OET about that. Terrific. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming, and have a good day. Okay, we'll now have the uh, Bureau press conference. Um, why don't we have wireless come first on the um, signal booster, please? All 
Are there any questions on signal boosters? Uh, Ruth, what's the transition period for the new rules to take effect? That was one of the issues in the proceeding is whether it would be six months, whether it would be longer. The um, sales and marketing requirements, that is no new boosters that are not compliant, uh, can be sold after March 1st, 2014. The, so until March 1st, 2014, none compliant can be sold? Um, yes, if they're in inventory now. It's slightly more complicated than that, and I think I'll, when the, uh, if you have detailed questions, we can get it to you, but the order should be out, we hope, later today. Okay, and then um, there's no presumption, is that right? No presumption. Uh, the other thing folks were looking for was at least a presumption of not, not having to get carrier consent that the, if the rule is, um, if the technical standard is followed, then the booster should be allowed. There's no presumption like that in the order. Is that right? There's no presumption. There's no presumption, Paul, but there is language in the order, uh, I think, outlining our expectations about what will happen and that um, we would anticipate that, you know, these kinds of uh, that non-consent would generally be, be, generally be based on interference uh, concerns. The, the consent or, or lack of consent would be based on yeah, interference. Yeah, right. Okay. That was, but, but it's not a it's not a regulatory requirement. How, how do you guys think the consent? How do you guys see the consent provision working? I mean, is it just something that I'm going to go on my website and tell AT and T that I bought a Wilson booster model X Y Z? Click a thing, it's done. Is that uh, how is that how are you how is it going to function on the? So there's there's two different things, right? There's consent and then there's registration. And the carriers, I think as you heard today, the wireless providers have virtually all said that they plan to consent, whether they do it on a model by model basis or just across the board, the consent is out there. And then the registration will work with the carriers however they design it. So, Well, uh, just one of the things I'm curious about is if that I went out and bought a Let's say it's a compliant booster, okay? It's a new booster so that it meets all of the uh, specifications that it, it is not supposed to interfere. I, I don't know how much these things cost. I get home, say I've paid, you know, 50, 100 bucks, whatever they cost. I have a problem in my wood shop that it doesn't receive the cell phone signal, and I hook it up, and then all of a sudden they say, no, am I out of luck? I mean, as far as the money that I've paid to Wilson or one of the other manufacturers? Well, any booster that interferes with a wireless network has to be shut down. The boosters can only operate on a non-interfering basis. That's true today, and that'll be true under the new rules. So whether you're out of luck or you can return it to the booster manufacturer, and you know, and that's a commercial deal that's up to the consumers and the booster manufacturers. But, but just, just to, I mean, just to, to clarify what's happening here is that, that we anticipate what will happen based on the you know, the, what the carriers have put into the record, is they will be, uh, for the most part, uh, consenting uh, in some more general way to boosters that are certified by the FCC to meet the new technical standards. So that what that means is that uh, we would expect that they will not be asking carry, uh, cu customers, consumers, to get specific customer-by-customer -customer consent uh, for use of the boosters, and, in fact, to the extent that something is available to be marketed and sold because it, in the U.S. because it met our certification requirements um, for those carriers who have offered the blanket consent, we would, I think it's reasonable to expect that they would, uh, the consumers would just be able to take it home, put it in the box and have, basically not have to worry about uh, consent. There will be labeling requirements um, in the order which you'll see, which basically uh, are intended to alert consumers to the need for consent, um, but at the same time do it in a way that doesn't cause them undue concern. Todd? Thank you. Are, are there non-interfering boosters on the market today? And if so, how can one find them? <laughs> uh, the best way to find a, a non are there non-interfering boosters? Yeah, boosters on the market that you guys consider to comply with your rules that you passed today. So there are, there are no rules for boosters uh, Understood. Today. But in your best judgment, are there boosters in the market today think, which would meet the non-interference goals that you established in there, the rules There are a wide today? range of boosters on the market, and there have been I'm sure there are boosters that are in operation today that are not interfering. Um, some of them actually already build in some of the technical safeguards that 
are in, mm -hmm. uh, envisioned in this order. Um, there are boosters that have had uh, caused great amount of uh, interference with the carrier networks, and the carriers have spent a, a, a lot of energy trying to track them down, and it's very hard for them to isolate. Um, you know, they see an interference event, they don't know exactly know what's coming, where it's coming from, and they have to sort of you know, diagnose it. It, it. And remember, the important thing here to remember is this is not consumers versus carriers. That if if if, if a carrier network, if a cell site gets overloaded by a, a bad function, a malfunctioning booster, that affects all the other consumers that are also served by that cell site. So what the order really tries to do is create more predictability and um, you know, as we talked about, is you know, common sense rules the road so that. Um, uh, you know, uh, everyone involved knows exactly uh, how to use boosters in a responsible way. Do, do you all have a list of naughty boosters that are on the market today? Boosters, have you fielded complaints about boosters? And if so, can a journalist get his hand on a list of complaints? I'm not, I'm not aware that we've done that. And it's, it's, it's more, it's, it's more, it's not so, so much the booster itself, but if the booster is installed improperly, um, so it may be okay if you install it correctly. If you install it improperly, then it causes a problem. So it's not – it wouldn't even be proper to label a booster like that. I don't know that we have a list like that. Uh, I think you, would, you, would, you would need to talk to the Enforcement Bureau okay. to see if okay. – Anything more on this one? Yeah. Um, Do you have a, a real idea of how many boosters are currently in use in the United States? I think you heard several of the commissioners refer to the number of millions, which is consistent with our best guess, but we don't know exactly. So mil millions of consumer boosters. Uh, okay, t uh, one more, Paul. And the the uh, there's no grandfathering for the ones already out there. Is that right? And then was there? Oh, I'm sorry. There's grandfathering for ones that have consent. So if it's already out there and... And the it has the provider's consent, okay. then it's grandfathered. Okay. And then there's industrial and consumer. What about small businesses? Where do those fit in? Do those fit in under consumer or industrial? The industrial, so okay. like a coffee shop or something like that, industrial boosters. Okay. So I'll, I'll, sorry, when these rules take place, will it be... Illegal to possess, own, market, sell, resell, all of the above, some of the above, non-compliant boosters? I think it's a complicated answer. The marketing and sales rules kick in on March 1st, 2014. So after March 1st, 2014, it will be inconsistent with our rules to market or sell a booster that is not in compliance with the rules. Between now and then, you can market and sell what's in inventory, and consumers can operate boosters if they have the consent of the wireless provider. Okay, thank you. Um, are we ready for 5 gigahertz? Has a question, Paul? So, uh, hi, Julie. Hi, Paul. Forgive me if I missed this in the presentation, but um, can you speak to to uh, how the NPRM will address the uni rules in the 5150 to 5250 megahertz band? And obviously, I'm referring to the NTIA letter uh, sent last night. Yeah, there, there's a a couple of aspects that we'll address. One is, can we make the the, the current rules in that lower band uh, are restrictive? They restrict the indoor operations. They have lower power than all the rest. So the NPRM invites comment on whether we can make those rules more consistent. Now, relative to the NTIA uh, point, one of the things we'll be working on with them in the industry are sharing technologies that can allow those things to work together compatibly without interfering. Are there any, you know, in, in the item, are there, are there any specific... Um, do, do you tee up specific rules for specific bands within 5 gigahertz? Yes, we do. Okay. Yeah, uh, the, the piece that uh, will uh, need a, a bit more definition is the precision of the sharing technologies, much as we did with the existing 
uh, spectrum. But things like the power levels and the out of band emissions that we normally address are all addressed in the, the notice. When are we, when are we going to see the notice? Is it going to be out this afternoon, or is it going to take a few more days? So our our goal is always to get it out the same day, uh, but we can't be sure of that. So I'm not sure if it'll be today or tomorrow, but it should be soon. Uh, what kind of power levels do these Wi-Fi devices operate at? It may vary across the band, and could you tell us once you give us an engineering type number if it's you know bigger than a bread basket or smaller or whatever you know I'm, I'm hearing like milliwatts mega I don't know could you give us some <laughs> could you give us some kind of comparison that that I could tell my kids who are smarter than I am anyhow sure. what it means um, I mean the easiest thing without getting into the DB although I can go there too uh, <laughs> is it similar to the devices you have at home today your Wi-Fi router that operates around the house uh, many of them that are on the market operate in both the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band today so we're talking power level Levels that are consistent with that. There are s some provisions for part of the band to be used at higher power levels that's used for rural backhaul services and so forth. But the, the typical devices are consistent with what you'd see at home. So we're, for the most part, not talking about devices that can pitch a signal from here to Alexandria. It's, no, it's limited no. range devices. Or is that, do I have that right? Right. right. T typically, uh, these things have a range of a few hundred feet for an individual, just like you experience with your, your home network. Now, of course, when you string together a number of them, just like at the Super Bowl, there were several hundred hotspots that were organized together to get coverage over a wider area, you can engineer a system to do that. But, the, but each individual typically is a relatively short range. Thank you. If you engineered a system like that uh, that had uh, several of the hot spots, several hundred connected, does that make the interference question more difficult to solve? So it, that that's taken into account in the analysis. Uh, that's what was done with the existing 5 gigahertz rules. So there were uh, assumptions made about what deployment scenarios of hundreds or tens of thousands of these that went into uh, an analysis that took into account, suppose they all turned off, but some of them stayed on for a short period. So all that is factored into the protections. Is, is there any uh, language in, the, and I notice in those proposed rulemaking, that um, has an effect on a municipal or other government entity that wants to uh, develop a Wi-Fi network? Uh, it, not specifically for those, but for all of the potential users and the innovators here, it creates more space, which creates the opportunity for more uh, folks to share the spectrum. Uh, and, and people have to determine for themselves about, for new applications that they're envisioned, does this facilitate that? Um, Todd, go ahead. Uh, uh, back on the auto safety issue, since they've spoken out about this, if I understand this correctly, they're going to have their chunk of airwaves that's assigned to them since 1999, and these new Wi-Fi uses we're talking about today may occur right next door to them. So the question becomes that I have is, if they're getting interference from the next patch over, how quick is the technology in these days typically? At, and I know we have, they don't have a final product and we don't have final rules. How quick is the technology at resolving the interference? I can see where in auto safety, where it's collision avoidance, eight seconds is way too long, but eight milliseconds might be fast enough. Where on that scale does the... Does the, the, the uh, the, the handshaking. Well, I, I won't give you a, a specific number, but I mean, the technology, to, if you think about it, and we said this even when the rules were originally set up, much of the technology for dedicated short range communications, the, the transportation, is similar to the unlicensed technology, and it, and it, it is all sharing with each other mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, relatively quickly. So, that has to be built into the system, even for transportation alone, let alone sharing with other devices. So I, I know that it, we're not talking eight seconds and so forth, uh, but whether I give you a number that's milliseconds or microseconds, or, or it, it's going to be very sh short. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's wrap it up soon, um, Paul. So uh, just a procedural question. H have you been, um, or has the agency been given any indication on timing 
uh, by uh, the NTIA and other agencies for conducting testing of possible interference. I know C- the CSMAC working groups are, are right. convening this summer, and so I- I'm, I'm curious, you know, what your expectation is for when the, the interf- interference testing might be concluded and the agency can move forward on, a, on an order. So NTIA released a report a couple of weeks ago that talked about the sharing at 5 gigahertz, and it included a detailed schedule. I think they uh, had a time frame of somewhere around the middle to the end of next year for the testing to have been completed and uh, reported the results to to, uh, uh, be published. So that's roughly the time frame we're we're looking at. Is is, is that the the time time frame? That's that's what your, you know, the agency is kind of banking on as as move forward, I mean, kind of move, moving along that path. Yeah, I think everybody involved in the process, uh, the, the private sector, the federal agencies, NTI and the FCC, uh, does everything they can to move the process quickly. But it takes time to do these kinds of tests. What tends to happen is you learn in the tests that uh, there are things that you can do that make the sharing work better. Uh, so it's a learning process for everybody involved, and it just takes a, a bit of time to do it. Final question. But you all acknowledge that that's, that time frame is one that you all won't, wouldn't be able to act before that those test results are in because you're looking at sharing spectrum with those agencies that – NTI's test will will look at that share. Yeah, I think, and, and bear in mind that there are different band segments across here. So, if there are pieces of this that are ripe to move ahead, and uh, then I'm sure that the commission will entertain that. Uh, for the pieces where we'll need to be informed by the test results, that'll be key before we uh, finalize all of the elements. All right, we have one really <laughs> short, easy question. The airways at issue in the NPR today are 5350 to 5470 and 5850 to 5925. Yeah, that's correct. Correct? Nothing yep. else? That's no, that's, that's so, whole, so, but okay. there's also the existing rules where we talk about elsewhere some, in the, yeah, elsewhere in the band. Yeah, all the existing, but that's the additional For spectrum. For new use of Wi Fi. Yeah. Good, thank you. Sure. Thank you very much.